Lots of times parents are asked to choose between keeping the family fed and sheltered and sending their kids to school because the incomes are so low. One of the possibilities to get out of that with kids that are a little older, this wouldn't apply to very young kids, is to figure out ways where those kids outside of school can earn some money, not a living, not a lifelong career, but money that supplements the family's income. And so I, I have seen USAID programs in the Dominican Republic and Mali which do this in varying different uh, circumstances. In Dominican Republic it was an urban barrio slum and there they were teaching these young adults skills such as sewing, hairdressing, uh, manicure, um, mixing chemicals together to c create household cleaning projects. And these uh, young adults were then able to sell those to neighbors and friends and create incomes of twenty, forty, a hundred dollars a month. That money could come back into the family and then the parents weren't faced with that choice of keep, send the kid to school or have them working or helping. In Mali, it was a rural setting, so they are some of the things that were taught had to do with agriculture, garden plots. Uh, in one case, um, it was about a small restaurant that they created for the village. And so, uh, but it was the same basic result that they, these were supplemental incomes. The kids would go to school in the day, and much as um, in, in times past in the United States, many kids would get up in the morning and deliver newspapers to all their houses in the neighbor and make some money. They're, they're making some money which helps the family feed itself, and yet the kids can keep going to school. They're not meant to replace conventional schooling at all. They are supplemental. The children still go to school. The training to do this is outside of school. And then the work that they do is outside of school. And so they, they're still able to do their schoolwork because we would never want to encourage child labor or anything like that. But I'll tell you, one young woman I met had finished her high school education as a result of this in Dominican Republic and is accepted to law school. And I said, are you going to stop doing this because she was making drapes? And she said, no, this is how I'm going to pay my way through college. And there are plenty of college students in Europe or the United States who have jobs to help them pay their way through school. And so um, this is just another variation. But if, if you've never given any of the tools to be able to figure out how to generate income, then it's not a possibility. And some of these programs also have a little bit of a capital component. In other words, besides training the students, uh, they have the money so that they might give the student the sewing machine or the, the initial load of chemicals to make the detergents. So it's sort of a very small equity contribution, to use business terms, to get it, to, to kick start it. And from there, the business has become self-sustaining. There's a global report on education that periodically comes out. And they have added up the, um, all of the money that's needed to fully educate children in the 46 countries with the lowest incomes. If you take that amount of money and if you subtract everything that the governments are spending right now, if you subtract everything that the private sector is doing and donors are doing, there's a gap, $26 billion. That gap is roughly equal to seven, eight times what the donors are spending in those countries. So how do we get from here to there? And surely raising domestic resources is a big part of it because there's no way um, given world economic conditions that donors are going to increase eight times what they currently do in education. There are several pieces to trying to address that challenge. The most important thing that's required is political will by the countries themselves. Without that, it's impossible. But with it, huge successes are possible. Um, some of the countries need technical assistance to f uh, figure out how to get there. And it may not be soft 
what they call soft skills. It might be literally computer hardware in the customs uh, department that mon at the borders. So it's a mixture of forms of technical assistance, but sometimes the countries need those uh, need to understand better some of the techniques of how to do it, or may need equipment and things like that. So th those are things that donors can contribute. And there are things that donors can do in their own countries because um, among the ways that these tax receipts are, causes of the tax receipts being insufficient is because profits are being moved around the globe and there are, and there's not all the transparency necessarily in the creation of companies or in taxation collections and so forth. So it's, it's not a topic that falls into traditional categories of developing countries, developed countries. It's not on any one to solve. We have to work together. And some of the most forceful advocates for this are people in developing countries. I mean, uh, Prime uh, Minister of Finance Ngozi is incredibly passionate about this. A minister in Philippines was on a panel with me recently and talked about that the only way they can fulfill their president's election campaign promises is to raise more revenues. And they have gone after t uh, smuggling and uh, better uh, processes inside the equivalent of their internal revenue service. Uh, Minister of Finance in, in Malawi talking about if they can raise more revenues then they're less reliant on donors and they will be more predictable, they can plan better. So a whole host of people are really talking about this and trying to take steps to work on it. We haven't fa uh, seen a lot of people actively campaigning against the idea that we would be factoring in results into budget decisions and things like that. And anybody who would hasn't talked to an American voter who expect us to maximize the benefits that come with their hard-earned tax dollars. In fact, a lot of ministers have embraced it because um, they're showing results. I mean, it's been incredibly exciting the last two days to sit with a lot of these ministers and hear about the things that they've done. I mean, for instance, just at lunch, the minister of Liberia was talking about how there were literally hundreds of people in th on their payroll who had no educational role in their ministry. They were there, they weren't working, they were collecting money. By working through all of that and eliminating all those, they were able to reduce the number of people in the headquarters and redeploy all that money to educating children. And she talked about how some of the patrons of those phantom employees were unhappy, but how ha very happy all the parents were that more money was flowing. So I've heard a lot of ministers say that they're very happy to, to have a chance at having additional funds because they're really performing. So, um, and it's just really essential. There's one outlier case of where GPE provided money to a government and then, um, I don't know all the reasons, but that same year the government cut their own funding education by almost a, a similar amount. And, you know, we're, we're not there to substitute for the host country government. We're there to work with them to do something bigger and better. So that's why we have to factor these things in to the overall equation of how we make decisions.